We are in for a very special episode this week in the Brand Builder Show because I am joined by the one, the only, the very, very legendary Kevin King. That's right, Kevin King, one of the best known names in the Amazon FBA space, is coming on today and sharing some absolute gold. I love this conversation. It was like I got some time to really ask questions of an absolute legend in the space. We talked about whether Amazon is even worth it for beginners in 2022 anymore. We talked about where the industry is going, Amazon aggregators, what six figure sellers should be doing to scale to seven figures, what seven figure sellers should be doing to exit their business and kind of everything in between. We talked about how Kevin's launching products right now. We talked about licensing deals with Disney. Like we talked about so much in this episode. It's an action-packed one, and I know you're going to get a lot out of it. So without further ado, let's get right into this episode with Kevin King. Awesome. Well, it is great to have Kevin King on the Brand Builder Show today. Kevin, welcome to the show. Thanks. Uh, glad to be here, Ben. Um, I'm glad you're here too. It feels like a bit of an honor for me. This is like my uh, celebrity moment. You are like one of the, the OGs of the Amazon space. And uh, I was uh, thinking about before we got on, when was the first time I kind of heard about you? And it was uh, back in the day where you used to do the podcast with Manny on, uh, I forget what it was even called back then. Was it was it AMPM back then? Yeah, I think it was AM, yeah, it was AMPM podcast. Yeah. Yeah, it would have been like uh, 2000, uh, late 2017, I think. So it's uh, going back a while and you just kind of blew my mind on those podcasts podcasts and you quickly became this uh, kind of massive name in the in the Amazon space so it's a, yeah it's an honor to have you on today I appreciate uh, it glad to be here man um, I, well, I've got lots of questions for you today and I'm going to kind of treat this like a little bit of a private consultation session and just ask you questions that I want to know and hopefully the audience is going to get some some value out of that. But I think one of the big questions everyone is asking is where is Manny Coates? I mean, he's just built Helium 10, sold it and sailed off into the sunset, hasn't he? He's done the entrepreneurial yeah. dream. Yeah, he and Guillermo started that in uh, 2016. He, he actually started selling late 2015. He started the podcast, AMPM podcast. Yeah. I think I went on that around March of 2016. I think was the first time I went oh, on okay. that yeah, podcast. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I, that was just by accident. Uh, he was doing the podcast and I was listening. I'd stumbled on him and was listening to him and joined his Facebook group. And there were some people posting in the Facebook group. And uh, I think I, they were posting some wrong information. You know, there's a lot of misinformation in Facebook. And so I kind of jumped on some people and said, hey, quit, quit the BS. You know, this is not how it works. This is yeah. how it works. Quit m misleading people. And Manny liked what I said invited me on the podcast and uh i was like no no i'm just a seller i don't i don't have any interest in going on a podcast or anything He's like no just come on and so i went on and i think in march of 16 uh was the first one and it was a really poor audio connection it sounded like i was in a tin can but uh, evidently it resonated pretty well with uh people listening to it because i just i just kind of said it like it is mm -hmm. and a lot of people weren't doing that yeah. Uh, but Manny, uh, they built, he and Guillermo built that up and in 20, September of 2019, they actually sold to a company called Assembly mm. and they, they retained a small little ownership part and stayed on for six months or so just to kind of help in the transition and, and <clears throat> around the time that COVID started, he was pretty much done. And so he, he's, he lives here in Austin, same place that I live. They moved from uh, California to Texas for tax reasons right before mm -hmm. they sold. Yep. And so, uh, he's got built him a nice little house and uh playing around in crypto and making a lot of money in crypto and uh nice. doing some, uh, nfts and uh yeah, yeah. just enjoying uh enjoying enjoying life <clears throat> you know buying race cars and whatever he he did very well for himself and uh, uh i think he's gonna get a both those guys are gonna get another payday as assembly is they acquired some other companies besides just helium 10 okay. pack view and a couple of ppc companies and mm. Valuation, I think, is about a billion dollars now for the the holding company that owns Helium Ten, and they just exploded. But it's a whole different world now. I mean, I knew them when it's just they were working from their apartments. You know, Manny started Scribbles and Frankenstein, and Guillermo <laughs> from Houston <clears throat> just had a baby, and I would get on some calls with them, and we were testing some different stuff. I wasn't I wasn't part of the the company, but I was just I became friends, and so they would call me, hey, can you test this? Can you? What do you think about this? And um, it's gone from those two guys to now 200 and something employees over there. Mm. Uh, it's, you know, they're doing a huge event in Vegas in September. Mm. Um, with some, they're going to announce that soon. Some pretty big speakers. It's a couple million dollar event that they're putting on uh, in Vegas. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's just, it's a whole different world now. Yeah. 
Oh, it's an incredible success story, and uh, you know what he did was was incredible, and he deserves every every bit of the life he now lives because it's uh, you know an amazing tool, amazing company, and uh, like you say, it's grown massively. I I tweeted the other day about how uh, because they put out an article about how they've had seven hundred thousand users of the Chrome extension. I was trying to do some of the maths on it, and you know uh, backward uh, calculate how many members they may have because of that. And I thought you know surely it's got to be a billion dollar company. So um, you know with all the roll ups going on, it's yeah it's a pretty incredible space yeah i mean helium 10 itself is not doing a billion dollars the, the <clears throat> assembly which is the name of the yeah, company yeah. that bought yeah. it is but helium 10 does well i mean i mean i do the freedom ticket course for them mm -hmm. uh you know which is free to anybody that has a helium 10 membership and i see how many people come through that and mm -hmm. it's it's uh crazy uh and you have to have a paid membership to actually mm -hmm. uh get into that so yeah their, their reach is you know it's not seven hundred thousand paying members no, uh, that, of course, yeah. <laughs> It's significantly lower than that, but uh, it's a healthy number, and it's a, a very good, uh, very good business. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But we uh, digress. We're here to talk about Amazon, selling on Amazon, and uh, and you and your input into that. So, but you know, a fascinating story, and I think it does play into you know what we talk about because the industry in itself is is just growing massively. There's crazy stuff going on, and uh, so yeah, we're definitely going to get your insight into some of that. But I'd love to kind of take you on a little bit of a journey. Like I said, you know, some of the advanced stuff I'd love to hear more about, but. You know that beginner uh, you know starting and then scaling and then exiting you know a few questions really at each stage of that journey because you've gone that whole whole process you've seen the good the bad the ugly and uh, i'd love for you to be able to share with the audience you know how you feel the market of selling on amazon is right now you know for beginners right now do you think selling on amazon is still a good business model for a new entrepreneur first business how do you feel about it yeah, I, th I do think it, it hasn't jumped the shark yet. It's still a very good business. Is, is it easy like it was uh, a few years ago? No, not at all. It, it's a whole different game now, hmm. uh, and it's becoming more difficult, and you're going to need <clears throat> a bigger skill sets, and you're going to need more money. Uh, that's not to say that if you're someone in Pakistan with 500 bucks, you can't change your life. Hmm. It just depends on what you're trying to do. You know, someone in Pakistan just go and, and start an Amazon business with 500,000 bucks and sell a thousand dollars worth of stuff a month with a two or three hundred dollar profit or, or and grow that to a, maybe a five thousand dollars a month business uh with a thousand or two thousand dollars a month profit that can change their life for them you know the average wage is five six hundred bucks whatever that's that can definitely help them but for someone like me and you uh you in the uk and i'm in the u.s a thousand dollars a month is is not even going to pay our, our rent probably mm -hmm. uh so it, it's all the perspective of what you have to look at so for people like ourselves, um, it you have to play at a little bit different level, and the opportunity is still there. Amazon's still growing, but it is becoming more of a pay-to-play marketplace. Mm -hmm. the, the the old way of just throwing finding something on Alibaba and putting your logo on it, sticking it up on there, it is going to be quite difficult unless it's super niche down. Mm -hmm. uh, it is leading more towards branding now and more towards establishing a true brand. Yeah. Amazon is closing a lot of the loopholes that you could have to rank. It's more of a long-term play. You know, in the mm -hmm. past, people would launch a product and expect to be on page one by using search, find, buy, or by using blast services or yeah. giveaways, yeah. you know, within a matter of weeks. And now that's difficult to do unless you have your own list mm -hmm. or own customer base. And so it, it's a more of a, for a new person, it's more of a long-term play. It's not something you're going to be able to quit your job and uh, start doing this full time, <clears throat> probably for a year or two, uh, yeah. unless you come into this with a lot of money yeah. uh, and, and have a cushion. So it, it, the opportunities are still there. And I, I see them every day. I do it with Product Savants, one of the companies I'm involved with. We, we mm -hmm. find products for some of the aggregators and stuff. <clears throat> and it, it's, it's there, but it, it's definitely more of a business rather than a, you know, a get rich quick type of thing that some yeah, people definitely. may have perceived it to be in the past. Yeah. And there's still a lot of people peddling uh, on Facebook and stuff that, hey, this is easy. Uh, it's easy to pick products. We can pick them for you. Yeah. Done for you services. There, there's so much, um, there's, there's a lot of scams. There's a lot of misinformation out there that, that leads people astray. And most, as a result, a lot of people aren't successful. Um, but yeah, it, the opportunity is still good. Yeah. And in an attempt to kind of shut out some of that noise, uh, what would you say are the two, three, key things that a new seller should focus on in this in this new market to succeed well it's cat well, you got to know your you got to know your numbers a lot mm -hmm. of people don't know their numbers i don't know how many new sellers get into they find a product using helium 10 or one of the other tools 
and there's, <clears throat> they're going to sell it for nineteen ninety five, <clears throat> and they they're, they're sourcing that they find a factory that it's six bucks or something like that to, to get it, and they're like, look, I've got a I got a twelve dollar pro thirteen dollar profit margin here, um, but they don't they forget to factor in all the fees, all the storage yeah. fees, all the fulfillment fees, all the shipping fees, all the delays, all the, the PPC costs, PPC costs are rising, uh, <clears throat> all those things and at the end of the day they have no margin and then a lot of other sellers come in including some factories in some cases that can play, they have an extra margin to play with, that margin they're selling it to you with, they can absorb that and, and it becomes a race to the bottom and, and they get priced out or they're generating cash flow but they're not generating profits and so that happens a lot. So knowing your numbers is, is would be key. Product selection is number uh, is is huge. I mean, mm -hmm. with, that's where the one thing I would never job out as an Amazon seller. I mean, that's the thing that you need to master yeah. and you need to be very very good at. And you know, people always say, "Oh, I'm hiring a VA to help me with product selection." I'm like, maybe hire a VA to help you give you some ideas. You know, they can go weed through some stuff and say, "Hey, what about this?" But you need to make that final decision based on mm -hmm. a knowledge and criteria because there's nothing more important than that product selection and mm -hmm. knowing how to do that is critical knowing how you know how good are your is your competition can you compete with them do you have the budget there's there's a lot of good opportunities that you may find in doing research but you you can't compete there's mm -hmm. no way you don't have the budget to compete with them so you have to find things that that fits your budget and a lot of people they, if they start with you know five thousand dollars they go out and they spend you know four thousand dollars on their first product from the factory and get it shipped over and they have a thousand dollars left and 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 they they fail because even if they succeed in selling that they picked a good product and start selling 20 30 units a day because they don't have an, they don't have any money to actually place an order for the second one so the second order because they haven't gotten paid for the first one yet so it becomes this vicious cycle where you run out of stock and you're constantly trying to relaunch and, and it People just don't do the math. They don't. They don't understand to, to, to how to do that, and that's that's a major mistake. So product selection, the financial side, and then <clears throat> knowing how to actually truly differentiate uh, mm -hmm. is. And differentiation is not just throw a PDF with it or uh, give a warranty, <laughs> but truly knowing how to differentiate. And I think you guys start having to do more, more and more of that. <coughs> Excuse me. <That's> good. <coughs> good step start having to do more and more of that on Amazon to really have a chance of, of succeeding. And you don't always have to be the lowest price. Uh, and um, There is a place, everybody has this mis this mis notion that Amazon is all about price. And price is extremely important for some categories and some products, but there are people that will pay a premium on Amazon. And if you can justify it, and you have to justify that with the differentiation of the product, the marketing of the product, the imagery, the video, the copy, Mm -hmm. And you can have a place uh, where you can su succeed by selling less, but make more money. You know, there's there's a, a a product that I used to sell just as an example of that. Of bully sticks. Bully sticks are, are treats for dogs, mm -hmm. and these bully sticks are actually they're the penis of a cow. That's uh, what they are. <laughs> uh, seriously, and they they you know when they butcher a cow, they want to make sure they use every piece of the cow. Well, dogs love these things to chew on them, like like bones or whatever. And so there's six inch ones and there's 12 inch ones. Well, a few years ago uh, on Amazon, these things were selling, they still sell like crazy, but they, they were, this is like 2016, 2017, they were selling like crazy. And so I, I stumbled across this in my research tools and everybody's selling these things in, in a plastic bag, like a <clears throat> poly bag, putting 30 sticks to the bag and putting a label on the outside of the bag <clears throat> and selling them for 30, 30, 35 bucks. And I, I started looking through the reviews and I see that people are complaining saying, hey, these things stink. When my dog chews it, the house smells like pee. You know, of course, it's the penis of a cow, and so some <laughs> companies, are not, they're not cleaning it properly or treating it properly. Yeah. And other people are saying it's staining uh, my couch. You know, the dog jumps up on the couch and, and chews on this, and it, it stains it. And and so I was like, i got to find a solution to this. So I started calling around, in the U and, and people were also saying, where is this meat from? Is it from China? Is it, you know, people don't trust, in the U.S. at least, they didn't trust meat from certain countries. So they don't want to know what their dog was chewing. So I went and found a, a guy in the U.S., in, in New England, in, in the U.S., that was a classically trained French chef. He had this 15-step process that he, natural organic process that he did to create his bully sticks. They were bigger than the, the, the competition. They were like big and thick, and they didn't stink, and they, they didn't make a stain, uh, but they were expensive. 
And so I was like, how much are these? He said, well, you know, I forget exactly what the cost was. The whole sale for three sticks was like 12 bucks or something like that. And I'm like, well, these other guys are selling 30 sticks for $30. And I was like, there's no way I can compete on this. Uh, but I started looking at it. I was like, yes, there is. So I actually, what I did is I took his three sticks, 12-inch <clears throat> uh, sticks. I put them in a cigar. I created a cigar box, like a really nice cigar box with a cool little label on the outside. It had some texture on it and it felt very fancy, you know, the Louis Vuitton kind of feel or whatever. <clears throat> I put these three sticks in that box with the label on it, did some really good marketing on the imagery and showing the difference between like, hey, these other sticks that are sold on Amazon, these are made by machine, they stink. It's like going to McDonald's and getting a fast food burger. But, you know, your pet is special to you. Treat them like royalty. Mm. Give them these other ones. Like Take them to a steakhouse. Take them to the nicest steakhouse in town. So I would show cartoons where there's a bunch of dogs in a car driving through a fast food restaurant drive through getting some like McDonald's type of uh, bully sticks. That's the competition. And then mine were like driving, uh, they were in a steakhouse sitting around a nice table with a, a little waiter with a bow tie with a, the, 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 the sticks on a tray. And that painted a picture in the customer's mind that these are, they didn't know who the hell I was, but it gave them that image, instant, instant credibility. And then I showed these come off a machine, ours are a hand cut, there's a knife, you see a hand and it's cutting the knife and, and I sold my three sticks for $54.95. Now remember everybody else is selling 30 sticks for 30 bucks. Wow. wow. And I sold them for $54.95 and I did well, we sold a lot. Now mm -hmm. could I rank for the keyword bully sticks? No. Because the keyword bully sticks was a, like 40, 50 at the time, 40, 50,000 searches a month, I'm sure it's a lot more now, I haven't looked, but 40, 50,000 searches a month. Uh, and to, to try to rank on page one for that, I was, there's no way. Everybody that going to the bully sticks, all the, all the listings were $30, 30 sticks. And here's my $54 one for, for three sticks. People think I'm out of my mind. They think I'm ripping them off. And so, you know, I would get <clears throat> sometimes comments when I would get on page one uh, briefly, you know, I'd get a bad comment or something. What the hell kind of ripoff is this? Mm -hmm. But then other people would buy them because I would get ranked for like bully sticks, no odor. Bully sticks made in the USA, bully sticks, uh, uh, thick hand cut or whatever. There's all these other longer tail keywords yeah. that I could rank on and I sold a lot. Uh, and so it, I didn't sell as many as the guys that were selling 36 for $30. You know, they're selling 100, 200 units a day on page one. Here's me selling 20 or 30, but I'm making more money than them. They're making a dollar or something or two bucks on every one they sell. So margins are so competitive, they're so low and I'm making five, 10 bucks on every one I sell. And it, I did well enough that the biggest company in the U.S., Best Bully Sticks, reached out to me and said, hey, what the hell are you doing, man? How in the world are you selling three sticks for 50-something dollars? we got to talk to you. So I ended up making a partnership with them and actually mm -hmm. took some of their other treats. They had duck treats and they had uh, antlers and some other stuff. And so we ended up with a partnership doing some other stuff. So the point of that whole story is you can differentiate. you got to think about it. Give the customer what they want. And I had a guy... Bought from me, I don't know, 30, 40 times. You know, every couple of weeks he'd buy another box for his, for his dog. So there's people that treat their dogs like kids. So if you understand that, and that's what you ask him about the new sellers, you've got to understand that. It's not just find something and stick, it, stick a label on it. Understand the psychology. Why do people buy what they buy? What is the intent on what they're looking for? And then where is the opportunity? And it's not always on those big, fancy, glamorous keywords. It's sometimes it's down in the weeds. Yep. What you, how do you, where do you find the line though with, at the moment, obviously the old thing used to be high demand, low competition, find something with the first page doesn't have, uh, you know, the average review count is under a hundred or something like that. You know, those are getting harder and harder to find because reviews are, are growing on the platform. Uh, where do you find the line? Do you not even look at competition anymore and just focus on differentiation or is competition still part of the, the factor there? No, competition is still part of it. I mean, when I'm looking at a keyword, like the bully stick example, if everybody on page one for bully sticks is selling for 30 bucks, 30, 30, 35 dollars, and my product I'm going to need to sell for 70, there's probably a next to zero percent chance that I can compete on page one for that. And you know, if you're not on page one, you basically don't exist. So I have to look and see are there other keywords? Are there bully sticks made in the USA where the price range is different? The best thing I like is when I see prices all over the place on page one on a keyword. That tells me I can go. With the, I can compete on the low end. I can compete on the high end. I can compete in the middle. That's number one. I do look at reviews. So if if um, I you know the hundred thing, throw that out the window. 
as much as possible, unless it's a brand new thing that, or something that just doesn't sell much. Uh, but uh, you know, I don't like to see a lot over a thousand. I don't like to see more than like four or five on page one over a thousand. Yep. Um, you know, review. You have to keep in mind reviews now. It's a little bit different. It's easier to get reviews now because it's reviews and ratings. In the yep. old days, you actually had to write some sentences to actually show up as a, a raise that counter on the reviews. Now you could just click a box and give it a score. And so the numbers are a little bit different than what they would have been in the past. You know, a thousand reviews in the past uh, was a lot. And that might be the equivalent to um, you know two or three thousand now because mm -hmm. of the way the system works. But it still matters. And so the, <clears throat> I do look at that. So if it's, uh, I look at the age. Uh, I also look at how good they are at Amazon. There's a tool from Brandon Young um, called Data Dive, yep. which is a really good tool that overlays Helium 10, and it, it takes a look at how, how good are the other sellers on Amazon, and that that's critical because if if they suck and they're missing a lot of the opportunity, you can come in and, and steal some of that. So it's knowing how to, like I said, go deep deep into the weeds and find those opportunities. So that that's that's critical right now uh, for what when I'm evaluating products. Also, the the margins uh, I, I look at. You know, I want to make sure I, I build in a, the a cost, the, the average cost of sales, yeah. at least ten percent uh, across the board. That, that, that's that's tacos. Sorry, not a cost. Yeah, yeah. A cost might be 20, 30, 40 percent, but the tacos, which is the total cost of advertising, I assign it to every single sale, whether it's organic or not, is at least ten percent. So I build that in. And then I like uh, the margins. Do I have room to play here? Can I source it at a, at a good price? Is there any kind of uh, diff any kind of moat around this product? Is it just a commodity? You know, is it is it something that everybody can do, and there's no really barrier to entry, or is it something that's really heavy and really bulky, and most people just don't want to mess with it because they they watch videos like you just said. It says find something light and small, fits in a shoebox, and blah blah blah. Uh, <clears throat> so I look at those. I don't look at how much does it sell? I look at how much can it make. So sometimes something, there's there's items that might sell 50 a month, but you can make $300 profit on every one because you're selling for $699. Uh, and there's hardly any competition in it. Uh, mm -hmm. So those can sometimes, the big bulky things can be can be really profitable. Yeah. And you're not selling as many, don't have as high as MLQ. So it, 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 it depends there. But I don't like to compete if there's a lot. Also, another thing I look at is that are there a lot of sellers from Asia, especially China. If there's a lot, of, if it's predominantly sellers from Asia, you know, there's tools that will show you that 60, 70 percent or more from Asia. I don't, I don't usually touch that okay. because those guys oftentimes are factories. They have a competitive advantage because they speak the language. They're willing to work on smaller margins. Some of them are, are doing black hat type of stuff, and I just mm -hmm. uh, so I stay away uh, from those if it's dominated by them. Uh, and once I start sourcing, if I find a good product and I start calling the factories, one of the first questions I ask is, do you sell on Amazon yourself? And the factory says, oh yeah, we sell on Amazon. These uh, four products right here are ours. And I look at them as four of the best sellers on Amazon. And I was like, nope, I'm not going into that category. So there, there's, there's a lot of things. That, there's a lot of, I find a lot of interesting products that I end up scrapping for one of these reasons uh, that it just it doesn't make sense. Yeah. Uh, but then I'll do other things where there's big opportunities on licensing right now. So for example, one of my companies, I have several different Amazon companies, and one of them uh, that we just formed uh, two years ago, and it's just now getting going, we kind of had a delay with COVID, is, is we have a, license, a licensing deal. We do dog products, but we have a licensing deal with Body Glove, the big surfing company. Mm, yeah, and yeah. so we went to them and we said, hey, we want to do dog life jackets and <clears throat> a whole bunch of other products uh, with your logo on it. And so we, we've gone to them and they said, sure. And so we just, we had some delays and we're just now getting the first one launched. And we haven't actually done the full launch on it yet. It's, it just came in, this, in, the, in the stock. But we're able to differentiate with that. And, and people that are looking for that brand or they trust that brand already will buy our product in a, a market that's a little bit saturated. And plus they'll help us launch it because they have athletes that have Instagram followings. They surf for some of them a million, two million people. Uh, once you know, it's a little bit early right now. It's it's just the start of March, but here in about a, another month, we'll start doing promotions with the social media guys, and they'll they'll be on their their paddle boards or their surfboards or at the beach with their dog and our product, and doing a post saying go get this on Amazon. So it's like, a, it's it's a free way to launch uh, and, and instant credibility. So there's a lot of opportunity in that area too. You know, yeah. you look at flashlights. You know, if you're going to sell flashlights, it's super saturated. 
But what if you got a license with the U.S. Army and, and you pay the U.S. Army a 6% licensing fee and you're able to put the U.S. Army logo on your flashlight and you say this is the toughest, strongest U.S. flashlight, you know, it's U.S. Army authorized, whatever. Instantly you have credibility. Instantly people will trust you over somebody else versus mm -hmm. if this is Kevin's cool flashlight. Uh, so it's all in the marketing. Uh, yeah. And so that, that, that's where there's a big opportunity right now on Amazon, you asked earlier, is in licensing. I think a lot of people are, are really not, have really not been touching that. So if you're good at Amazon, you can crush it at, um, if you get the right licenses. And, and that builds a moat, it builds a wall around you, other people can't come in, yeah. and you get instant credibility. And in a lot of cases, these licensees will help you promote the product. The guys with our body glove life jackets, they, they loved them so much. The samples we sent over, they're like, we're gonna introduce you to Walmart the stores. We're gonna introduce you to big sporting goods, the big sporting goods stores, and make all these introductions that might take us a year or two or beating on the walls. They they make a call and say, check this out. They already have those relationships, so you can leverage that. So there's there's a lot you can do there. The You mentioned licensing fee of 6%, is that uh, around normal? Yeah, it's usually around, it's usually between five and it depends on the license, but between five and eight percent is is fairly normal. Yeah, There's a, a huge show called the pay. licensing expo. I'm sorry. I was just saying that's that's a pretty low amount to pay for something that could be so significant yeah. for your business. Yeah, it's 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 a low. It it is. I agree. Yeah. And then there's minimums. So like we have to commit to minimums. So we have to guarantee a certain number of sales. And there's some upfront payments and there's some reporting. So there's a little bit of hassle factor involved in there. But it, but it can be definitely worth it. Yeah, definitely. Now you're not going to go out if you're brand new. You're not going to go get a Disney license. You're not going to go get you know the license for Frozen. If you're a brand new seller, you, but you could get the U.S. Army. You get the second, third tier license, which is, can be great too. And then have a track record of making sure you do pay your royalties on time and everything. And then when you go to someone like Disney uh, to get a license, they'll they'll look and say, okay, you know what you're doing. We trust you. You know we, we know you're going to pay us. Uh, and you can start going after the bigger licenses. So don't think you can go get a Disney license right out the gate. It might be a little bit difficult, but you can get yeah. like in, in, uh, NCAA college football teams. It's not so hard to get. And those are six, seven uh, percent. Th there's lots of opportunities in that area. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, that's good. I mean, it sounds like you're still pretty active in the space. You mentioned earlier ranking, launching, lots of changes with TOS recently. What are you doing right now to, to launch products aside from obviously licensing an off Amazon audience? Are there any on Amazon tactics that you're using right now? I mean, yeah, some of my, one of my, a couple of my companies, I have a list. So we have a list of customers that we've cultivated over uh, one of the companies over 20 years. So we're able to launch pretty quickly mm -hmm. uh, just by email on that list. Uh, but if I don't have a list that identifies with it, uh, one of the things that I'm doing is, is I'm lowering the price. Uh, so I, if my price is $19.95, I'm lowering it down to like $3.95. Because I, one, I don't have any, first thing I do is I try to get buying reviews. And that takes a little bit of time. And yeah. sometimes you'll get takers, they'll take all, now you can do up to 60, I believe, uh, buying reviews. Sometimes you'll wipe it out. Sometimes it depends on your product. You might only have a couple takers um, that will take it, but try to get buying reviews out of the gate to get the review process started. And then, uh, then when I launch, if I don't have a list, if I don't have, I'll, I'll do a little bit of outside traffic, a little bit of influencer um, if I can. But the main, the main thrust is heavy PPC, top of search placement. So I'll bid extra to get top of search placement. I'll lower my price to some ridiculous low price, like three dollars and ninety-five cents. Mm -hmm. And, and then what will happen is someone that sees the product, I'm at the top of the search results, hopefully, they see that, hey, this is $3.95, everybody else is selling for 20 and they look at mine and like, wait a second, this guy doesn't have any reviews, what if this product sucks, but they click through, look at my listing, it's good pictures, it's good, you know, I convinced them there, I've, I've done a good job on that, on that aspect, and addressed all their concerns. And then they're like, what's what's four bucks? You know, worst case is I throw this away. You know, a lot of people will take a risk on four dollars if everything else looks good. And so I can get people in the door and because of the, the low price, I'm getting a lot of clicks on my ad, top of placement ads, and then getting conversions. So that's telling Amazon that, hey, these ads are working. <clears throat> and then I slowly raise that price up over the course of a month or two to try to get it back to my target of 1995. But I'll leave it at that low price for several weeks. And so you're going in the hole. I mean, you're losing money yeah. on the ads. You're losing money on your fulfillment costs. You're going in the hole uh, to do this. Uh, but that that's 
there, there's not a, many other ways. Other ways are you take the longer approach, and some people are teaching now, like go out and build an audience, go out and build a Facebook page or Instagram page and build an audience and, and then leverage that audience to launch. But that's, that's hard. Uh, a, lot, a lot of people, you know, there, there are some people that have success with that, but the vast majority of people can't do that. Yeah. It's, that's not easy. And then you get a lot of people, even if you get a thousand people on a Facebook group that are all dog lovers, that doesn't mean they're going to buy your leash. Uh, they're not necessarily buyers. So that's, uh, that's, that's difficult uh, to do that. And most people are not able to, to pull that off. So you've got to get creative. And then like one of my, on one of my companies that, that have the list, um, I'll, we have variations of the products and I'll tell them to go buy all the variations uh, and they'll go buy all the variations and then what that does is it instantly gets them and the customers who viewed this, viewed that, customers who bought this also bought that. Yeah, yeah. Or, and that, that starts just uh, snowballing with other people's products in the category and you start showing up all over the place. So that's, that's another way uh, that, that we do it. And then I start with the lower keywords, the lower volume keywords. So keywords that are high volume, you know, like if those bully sticks and it's 50,000 searches a month, I'm not even going to touch that word. I mean, I'm going to make sure bully sticks is in my title or in, in my listing. I'm going to make, you know, I want to get a little bit of credit for it, but I'm going to go after something that has 1,000, 2,000 searches a month and find five or 10 of those where I can compete and try to maximize those while I'm building my reviews, while I'm raising the price. And then once I get to a position in a couple months where I'm back at my normal price, I have some hopefully good reviews, a decent number of good reviews, then I'll start thinking about, let's, let's try to go after some of these bigger, mm -hmm. more popular keywords and see if we can get ranked there. But if you're trying to do that too soon, uh, it's, it's going to be difficult. And you, yeah. might, you may make it to page one, but you're not going to stay. Yeah. You are someone that has always brought these kind of strategies to the forefront. You know, like I say, I remember those early days with the podcast, like lots of different strategies that you were trying and testing. Do you feel like the kind of the hack days are over, the kind of trying to wrangle your way into rankings? Is it a lot more about product quality? How do, how do you feel? Are you still trying and testing lots of different strategies? People like hacks. They like quick solutions. People mm -hmm. like to know hey, if I do this, I can rank right away or I can solve this problem, but the hacks are not, they're cool and they're interesting and sometimes they can, you know, they can fix a problem. You, you got a hijacker on your listing or something, if you know the right hack to try to get them off, that can come in handy. Mm. But if it, it if it's hacks for ranking, those are usually short-lived mm. and the vast majority of it, it, you, it, the money in this business is actually not in running your business, it's in selling it. Yeah. I mean, so if you're not thinking about building something that's a true sellable business to one of these aggregators or maybe a strategic buyer if it's not an aggregator, that's where the, the biggest payday is going to come. And you may have, you know, 20% profit on paper every year, but I can tell you that if you're doing a million dollars a year in sales on Amazon, and your profit margin at the end of the day is 20%. You're not putting 200,000 quid in your pocket uh, because you're having to take some of that money and reinvest it in the next products or new product development. You might be putting 50, 100 quid in your pocket yeah. if, if you're lucky. And so, but if you sell it, you're going to all of a sudden put, you know, in today's market, the, the multiples are crazy, you know, three, four, five, six X. Sometimes you hear crazier numbers than that. But if, it, if the average was even four, you're putting 800 quid in your pocket um, right away <clears throat> instead of 50 or 100. And then you, you have a war chest. Now you know what you're doing. Now you can come back and, and do it again. But the problem is there's a lot of people that are selling right now to aggregators that started in 2015, 2016, mm -hmm. and they were right place, right time and they were able to get a product uh, in at the right place. They were able to just organically grow it. Now they've got 10,000 reviews and they don't know what the hell they're doing. And so they sell to an aggregator, then they come back and try to do it again and they fail. You know, I'm seeing this happen a lot. Uh, so if you know what you're doing and you have the fund know the fundamentals, then, then uh, this can be extremely lucrative and just work and turn it and leverage it. It's just like selling real estate or something. Yeah. I've got one buddy that they're on their fourth business right now selling. They sold their first one for like almost $4 million, 3 .8 in 2017. Then they sold another one for 6 and another one for 10 Then they're about to sell one for 25 And they're <laughs> wow. working and turning it. You know, they, they're like um, working, turning that cash. And, and they're, they're stepping, stepping their way up into serious money. Yeah. And you can do that in this. Uh, and, but you got to be thinking about that long-term strategy it, it's not a get rich quick thing 
Yeah, and I think sometimes people bemoan the idea that, oh, I wish I'd got started sooner, I wish I was selling back then. But I try and tell people, you know, the fact that you're selling now, it, it forces you to become a better entrepreneur, a better business owner, and that actually will be better off for you in the long term. Because like you say, there's people that would have just built a big business because they were in the right place at the right time, but don't actually have the skill set to then go and do it again. And so, you know, this actually may be a better time to get in it for the reasons you talk about as well. You know, the whole exit market, it um it's crazy right what what's your thoughts on the next five years of that well i think it's crazy it's gonna it, it's gonna settle down right now the multiples are high so if you're in the position to sell this year i would seriously be looking at that because the multiples are, are definitely higher i think they're gonna settle down i think you're gonna see some some consolidation there's 100 plus aggregators out there right now mm. and there's no way they're all going to survive. You're going to see some of them buying each other, some of them going out of business, some of them are getting into this realizing, holy shit, this is actually ain't that easy. Um, yeah. and so I, I think you're going to have five or ten major ones left standing. You're going to have, always have some little ones. And those guys are going to be owning a lot of the market. And so they're going to be the new, you know, in the past, people are always like, I'm, we're competing against the, in the West, we're competing against the Chinese sellers. They're the ones selling for the cheaper price. They're the ones doing the black hat stuff. They're the ones doing, that was the general consensus. But I think you, that's still going to be there, but you're also going to have, oh shit, here's the aggregators. They completely own this category of whatever, you know, of dog leashes. There's no way I can compete against them because they have deep pockets, deep resources, and they're doing, you know, they're playing by the rules for the most part. Um, and there's there's no no way to compete against them. So you're going to have to find those those other opportunities where they're not in. Uh, or the holes that they haven't filled and there's a, a finite number I think these guys can buy that you know you look at marketplace pulse where they just say 60,000 people what uh, companies did over a million dollars yeah in U US dollars in sales on, on Amazon as a third as a third party seller last year if that number is accurate that's great that's worldwide so it's not just the US it's worldwide but you got to figure a third of those are probably big companies they're uh, Adidas and Nike and mm -hmm. and some of those seller accounts are big companies, so those aren't in the aggregator space. So if you're left with 15, 20,000 of these that are doing over a million dollars, that's a lot of companies. Yeah. But a lot of those are not actually making money. Uh, they're, the margins are so small, they're just robbing Peter to pay Paul to stay alive, or they're wholesale businesses, which aggregators really don't want, and resellers. So there's a pool of five or 10,000 maybe that these guys could potentially go after. And if they gobble up a thousand or two thousand of them in the next few years that's a significant number uh, mm -hmm. uh and be covering a lot of bases uh, so that's where you're going to have to go into licensing go into really developing your own true brand not just a uh, finding an olive olive product product and sticking your name on it you're going to have to you have to create something of value uh, and mm -hmm. to have a, a, a the best chance of success and, and getting a good multiple in the end uh, down the road yeah. Yeah, so last sort of topic of conversation, because I know you're a busy guy, um, but on that front, you're talking about something of value, creating something that is sellable. For anybody that's listening, you know, we'll have listeners that are in that kind of six figure range, they wanted to build towards an exit. You know, what would you say are the keys right now to focus on? Because I feel like everyone has a different opinion. You know, uh, yes, build diversification. No, keep it concentrated and so much talk. Uh, you yourself, what do you believe are the keys for a six-figure seller to really build as much value as they can and exit in the next one to two years? Focus on one or two markets. You, you hear that diversity. You need to diversify. You have all your eggs in one basket. Yes, there is some danger to having all your eggs in one basket, but to, you can diversify. You don't need to... You can spread yourself too thin and you mm -hmm. can take your eye off the prize. It, the same amount of time that you could spend trying to build up a, a Shopify store, if you put that same effort and energy and money and investment in people into expanding to Amazon Canada from the US or from the UK to Germany, you're going to make a lot more money. Go where the money's at. And it's, it's on Amazon. And if you want to expand off of Amazon in the US, maybe consider Walmart. Uh, you might need a Shopify site just for legitimacy and to have that, you know, people, there are people that are going to go Google your name and to have it there, but don't, I wouldn't put a lot of effort into that. It's a different type of buyer, different mentality, but having that there and a few sales come off it, but don't put too much energy into it. Um, that that's key. You need to find a way to build a, a, a list. So you need to, you need to own your customer. You don't own it on Amazon, but, 
you can download it through you know tax jar or some of those services you can get those customer names but they're still not truly your customer but that's better than nothing but you need to find a way on all your inserts to get these people onto your list and that doesn't mean here's go fill up sign up for my vip club or fill out a warranty card most people aren't going to do that and that's not going to you want to get them to buy something from you i mean one of the things we do with our our dog stuff is we put an insert in and we say hey uh get a sample you know if we get dog treats you get a sample of all of our treats you get our duck treat you get our antlers you get our this it's free just pay 7.95 shipping so the fact that they're willing to actually pay 7.95 shipping basically covers my my cost and i send them out a small it's a small little sample pack that gets them that they can try it with a dog oh my dog really likes these duck things and they come back and they order my duck stuff but i also have their name as a buyer not as a tire kicker, not as an Amazon person, but they actually gave me seven dollars and ninety-five cents. They, they actually took that. It was worth. There's a huge difference in someone that gets something for free or just signs up for a warning for someone that actually gives you money, no matter how much money it is. So try to get them to, to do that. Come back and market to your current customers. A lot of Amazon sellers are not marketing to their current customers. I mean, the same thing we do on the dog stuff is I ask them <clears throat> when they go and do this. I say, "What's your dog's birthday? And what's his name?" and breed and that they they gladly fill that out and then we send a postcard a physical postcard a piece of paper through the mail uh, about a week before their birthday it says happy birthday fido uh congratulations you get 20 percent off your next uh, bag of treats on amazon yes, be sure yeah. to give this to mommy uh to to ben your daddy uh to daddy ben uh so <laughs> that he can get these for you um and, and it works like a charm so you're remarking to them but you got you gotta be thinking about that kind of thing, and that can maximize your value when you go to sell, and not just to an aggregator, but it can max. Sometimes aggregators aren't the best ones to sell to. Maybe you're building something that a, a Procter and Gamble or a big, huge company it, it will want to come in and buy as a just strategic buyer versus a an aggregator, and those can be even bigger paydays. So, um, you look at look at some something like what Helium Ten did. You know, that's more of a strategic buy than it was an, yep. an aggregator type of thing um, that that's something you got to think of. and then getting your getting your numbers I mean every, thinking about everything that you're paying for you know every piece of software you know if you're paying a hundred dollars a month for a piece of software you've got a helium 10 and you have jungle scout and you have viral launch are you really using them on or can you just go with one of those and, and that two hundred dollars or a hundred dollars a month for for jungle scout if you don't need it just stay with helium 10 that, that's 1200 bucks a year and a 5x multiple that's six thousand dollars out of your pocket right there yeah. so those little things uh getting your money back you know using using helium 10 or a company like Gatita or somebody mm -hmm. to get all the money the damages and the lost stuff back can add hundreds of thousands to some businesses yeah. there's a lot having your sops uh, getting you know systems in place so that when you step out this thing can keep running those are all important things to be thinking about when, you, when you're going to sell yeah, no, very important. If you were selling a business today, how would you go about it? Would you go to a broker? Would you go direct to aggregators? What would you do? Uh, I would probably, um, it depends on the business, size of the business. Um, mm -hmm. it, but in most cases, I would recommend at least consulting with a, a broker. Or some brokers are better than others. People like Quiet Light or Global Wired Advisor. If, you, if I was selling to an aggregator, I'd probably go to someone like Quiet Light. And say, hey, because even though I'm paying them a fee, some people say, like, why are you going to pay them a fee? They're going to get your books in order and find a lot of holes that you may not know. That's going to actually increase what you can sell it for. And I think they, in most cases, they're going to get you, not every case, but in most cases, they're going to be able to get you more money. Uh, and, and it's just going to be a cleaner, smoother process. Selling a business can be a pain in the ass. There's a lot of due diligence. There's a lot of stuff you got to do. They'll make sure that you have your stuff in order. If I'm selling to a more of a strategic buyer not an aggregator i would go with like global wired advisors those guys are really good at like investment funds buying it or, or big aggregator type of people buying it and can help you i would i would go that direction now if you're selling it you know you're doing fifty thousand dollars a month uh, in sales and you got to, you know, it's a small sale it's a hundred thousand two hundred thousand dollar sale those guys are probably not going to get you a whole lot more um but yeah. if you're a seven figure seven eight nine figure seller i would i would be using somebody but if you're yeah small you know you could just go list it on empire flippers or something yeah. or fda brokers or one of these others and, and probably be okay mm -hmm. yeah no, that's wise words definitely uh, i think you know the idea of using a broker can actually make you more money right when even with their fee included because that's what you're paying them to do their expertise so yes yeah, good to good to hear you say that too um 
your uh, we'll kind of look to wrap up and um you know appreciate you coming on so much what's the 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 one kind of strategy maybe that we haven't talked about that you think is the you know really good strategy that amazon sellers should be deploying now ppc product research anything like that that you feel that we haven't talked about but it's really valuable for the audience i mean i think using the data i mean amazon's opened up data like brand analytics and mm. but knowing how i mean we've created our own little software tool for brand analytics and being able to analyze that data and we're tracking stuff and um, we're finding a lot of really good opportunities in there. The product opportunity explorer, the brand analytics, there's still some holes. And then combining that with the tools like Helium 10 and Data Dive, yeah. you can really find m- massive opportunities still out there. So I think that's the thing that a lot of people, they're not doing the full analysis. And a lot of this that used to take weeks to do, and a lot of spreadsheets and a lot of VAs and handwork now can be done in a matter of minutes with some of these software tools. And I think. That is where a lot of people are, are making a mistake. And then also, to, you know, the diversity in sourcing and with what's going on in Ukraine, what's going on in the world, I would be looking at, at, at diversity of sourcing. You know, if you're in the U.S., looking at Latin America, perhaps. If you're in Europe, looking at some of the options in Europe or Turkey, Pakistan, depending on what you're selling, um, yeah. and not be so dependent on China. I mean, China is definitely the easiest. It's the world's factory. You're still probably going to have to do some stuff there. A lot of the raw materials still come from China. But I would be looking at, at, at diversifying a little bit on, on some of my, my supply chain as well. Yeah, that's really good. Really good and, you know, really helpful. That last question on the data, what you talk about finding opportunities in that data. What do you see as those opportunities? Is it underserved keywords? Uh, you know, what, what, what should people be looking for in that data? Well, I look for, I, I, we track it over the, course of a year so we, we see all the trends and we see the SFRs but the number one thing I do is I look I look for competition because they give you the conversion percent they give you click percent and conversion percent on the top three and so I look for opportunities in that, using that conversion percent so I'll take those three those top three the conversion percents and add them together and I'll add an extra column to this if you're doing this in Excel you download brand analytics add a column add up those conversion percentages so if one of them is 13 percent one of them's 20 percent one of them's six percent that's what 30 uh, 39 percent total uh and i like to see under 40 percent for those top three that are that are that are getting the most because that's t- they're telling you these are the ones that are converting on that keyword and if it's less than 40 percent that means 60 percent of the sales on that on that particular keyword are coming from everybody else mm-hmm. that tells me there's a what if even if i get to, can rank to spot number four or five on the page there's room for me to grab a significant part of sale, portion of the sales on that keyword. And then I use, I look at title density and I look at the, okay, this keyword, this, cert, this brand, this brand analytics keyword, how many times does it appear in the rest of the keywords in the, the list of a million plus brand analytics and how many times does it appear in the title of those three that Amazon's showing you that get the most clicks and the most uh, uh, sales. And that tells me a title density is two different numbers. And, and if that, that is a high number, that tells me there's a lot of places where if I could just rank on this little route, I could probably do really well. And there's a lot of doors, there's a lot of keywords in the list, you know, 15, 20, 30, maybe 100 different keywords that are making some sort of sales that I can go in and try to find, carve out my little niche of 10, 20, 30 of those keywords that are going to really make some money for me. Mm-hmm. And then but using, combining that with tools like Data Dive that where you can see how good are people on Amazon, you can really zero in on where the golden opportunities are really fast. And so the com- combination of Helium 10, Brand Analytics, and Data Dive, I think is, is uh, a no-brainer. Mm-hmm. And there's tools from people like Tryon Turku, who's a, like this genius guy, Romanian guy, that has like a little private mastermind. And if you're in his private mastermind, you can get some special tools that he's created, and they're really good tools. But in, in the past that I was going to those kinds of things to get data that, that you couldn't get from Helium 10 or some of the other tools. But now with these, this combination, you can, um, you can get almost anything. You know, if, I don't, you've been doing this for a while. You remember three or four years ago, people were buying reports from China. There was inside, you could actually get the whole, uh, you could pay someone 50, 100 bucks and you could get a, a you know, like spreadsheet back in a couple of days from some some guy that worked for Amazon China or Amazon India, you know, <laughs> actually here's my competitors, here's all their PPC, here's their everything. Uh, and you're like, holy shit, I need to target this and do this. And you don't need yeah. to do that anymore. The tools have gotten so sophisticated 
and Amazon's giving enough of the data, they don't give everything, but they give enough of it, and combined with Helium 10 and what, what Brandon's doing, the, those three right there is all you need. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That, that, that title. Title. It's, like a, you know, it's like driving a race car, you know, me and you know how to, we know how to drive our car down the road, but can we go drive an F1? You know, you get, if you become that F1 driver, uh, and you can race to the riches on Amazon. Yeah. Yeah, well, we got got Brandon coming on next week, actually. So I'm going to be drilling him about the uh, the data dive tool. Yeah, Looking forward really to that. Smart guy. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, that that title density uh, column on Helium Ten is a game changer. It's such a powerful aspect that not many people are using. No, I mean I'll give you an example of that one. Uh, we were selling hand sanitizer, little bottles of of uh, two two ounce. What's that? Sixty milliliter uh, for the UK on it. Sixty milliliter hand sanitizer. Uh, in 2020, and we launched it, and we're doing all right, and then started having a little bit of fade off of it. And I was, I looked at brand analytics after six months or something, just looking through different words, and there's a word that came up in there that had not come up in my original research, and I was like, what the heck is this word? It was, it was hand sanitizer party favors. So people were actually, <laughs> actually buying these little small, you know, pocket-sized hand sanitizers. Yeah. They have to give them away, you know, at parties and events and stuff. And, and I was like, I look at the title density, like you're just talking about, and there's like two people had that in their title. And I'm like, all right, I'm going to change one of my one of my listings to have that in the title near the beginning, and see what happens without doing a heavy PPC or a launch or anything. I just changed it and instantly went from page six, I think, to page two, within like 20 minutes, uh, and then got a few sales and went to page one, and we started making. You know, it wasn't a huge number of sales, but we started making. 10, 15 sales a day, just by realizing that title density and nobody else has it in the title, how important that was and just mm. making that change. It's super important. Absolutely. Yeah. So anybody listening hasn't checked that out yet, grab a Helium 10 subscription, go into Cerebro's, uh, the main area you can find it. Uh, look at title density and, and get those titles, get those keywords with low title density into your title. And uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's so much easier to rank for those. So super powerful feature. Uh, that's um, really helpful. Kevin, I've honestly so appreciated having you on and I feel like there's so many more questions I want to keep asking you, but we've been nearly going an hour already. So I will uh, look to draw it to a close. But you're doing lots of things at the moment. Where's the best place for people to find out more about what you do? You mentioned the, the kind of the sourcing stuff. Is, is that a major thing for you? Or is that uh, more of a side thing? What's what's that? Well, I've got I've got eight different businesses involved in the Amazon space. I, I'm a seller and <laughs> Uh, you know, I either own or I'm partners in four or five uh, seller accounts uh, that, that we're selling on. Then I do product savants, which is we find product opportunities for like some of the aggregators. Okay. And then, then I, I do the training for Helium 10, do their freedom ticket uh, and their Helium 10 Elite, which is their advanced training. And then I hold my own event, the Billion Dollar Seller Summit, twice a year, once virtual. It was just, uh, just recently in February. Uh, there's a live one in August in Austin. Um, that's a pretty high ticket, uh, big seller event. And then the best way to reach out to me is probably just uh, follow me on Facebook. I'm not on LinkedIn or Instagram really or any of those. I don't really pay. But uh, uh, follow me on, on Facebook and you'll, you'll kind of see what's what's happening. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for all you've done for the, you know, the Amazon selling community. There's tens, probably hundreds of thousands of people that have learned from, from you with Freedom Ticket. And, uh, you know, you, you've got a lot of legacy out there in the space. So we appreciate you a lot. No problem, Ben. Glad to be here. And, uh, best of luck to everybody out there amazing what an episode that was i enjoyed sitting down with kevin so much and i hope you got something out of it if you did make sure you hit that like button on youtube or if you're listening on the podcast please do leave us a review and subscribe to the podcast because it helps us keep getting on the caliber of guests like that next week we have another goat of the amazon space how can you have more than one goat because there's only one greatest of all i, I don't know but multiple goats and we've got them on the brand builder show next week is going to be another great episode so make sure you subscribe to get notifications of when that episode is out they keep on coming and it's going to be a great few weeks on the brand builder show okay i'll see you next week